Hey Andy, what's going hello, on? Hello, hello. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Perfect. Great to be in the great city of Chicago. I love it. Come on in. Got me on my right. day off. Dude, perfect. I know you came off like a long string of uh, nights, didn't you? It's uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a stretch this month. I've been working a ton, um, so I'm glad to finally have a day off and uh, get to catch up with you. Exactly. And I hope you have enough brain power for 73 questions. So are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. So, what is your name? My name is Adam Goodkoff. And your specialty? I work in emergency medicine. And how many years into training are you? Uh, about a year and a half in now. I'm a second year resident. And where'd you go to undergrad? Uh, undergrad at University at Albany. And medical school? Medical school at the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. And did you take any gap years before going to med school? I didn't take any gap years formally, but I did take a teaching fellowship year. So it's something in some of the osteopathic schools. Basically did my first year and second year like a regular medical student. And then third year, I did 26 weeks of teaching and 26 weeks of rotating. And I did that twice. So it comes out to one full year of teaching time, one full year of being a third year. And then I went on and completed my fourth year. And basically that helped pay for some of my tuition. And it gave me incredible experience teaching anatomy and ultrasound to first and second year med students. That's awesome. I'm sure they greatly appreciated it. Yeah, it was, it was a really cool experience. Um, you get to meet a ton of different personalities and student types and learners, and uh, it's been really helpful, especially in the emergency department. Awesome. Now, speaking of med school and med students, what was your favorite part of medical school? Ooh. I really enjoyed the simulation and the whole, it becomes very clear that it's just an opportunity to immerse yourself in medicine without any other concerns. So, you don't have to worry about a job. As much as loans kind of suck, uh, you have money to live on. You have money to live on to pay your rent and your sole purpose in life is to learn medicine and to study kind of the basics of medicine. And so it's this really cool opportunity to dive in and master a subject and not feel like you have other responsibilities. Gotcha. So what specialty did you think you were gonna go into on your first day of medical school? I think I always knew it was gonna be emergency medicine. I was. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was an EMT before coming to med school, and so I just, I knew what I was getting into, and it's kind of what I wanted. That's awesome. Now, were there any specialties you immediately said, absolutely not for me? Yeah. Uh, the outpatient, pretty much anything with a clinic, I just realized was not for me. The pace was not for me. Um, ton of respect for the folks that do that, but it just, it, it didn't fit my style. Teach their own. So now back to what you do love, what made you first fall in love with emergency medicine? I think emergency medicine's a really cool field. We get the chance to meet a ton of people and establish a connection really quickly with people. And that's essential to what we do. If you can't connect with people quickly, you're not gonna be able to get the information and the trust that you need from patients. And then of course we also do a lot of procedures. So we get a lot of really critically ill people and we get a chance to make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Um, sometimes it's a big difference, sometimes it's a small difference, but we get to you know, interact with a lot of people um, each and every day. So it's, it's very rewarding. Now, emergency medicine is a very, very popular specialty, um, definitely within my class for sure. So for those who are interested in being in your place one day, how long does your training take after medical school? So it's a great question. Uh, generally, it's three years at most programs in the country, but there are still some four-year programs. And there are some folks who go on to do a fellowship after doing an emergency medicine residency. You absolutely do not have to. Uh, you still can do ultrasound and all of those things, but there are ultrasound fellowships, medical toxicology fellowships, critical care medicine, um, wilderness medicine, EMS. So there's a lot of options if you want more training after that, but a lot of folks stop after their three years or four years and go get a job. So speaking of further subspecialties, are you thinking of doing a further subspecialty? I don't think so. Um, as you might know, I do a lot of education already on social media and it's something that I'm really passionate about. I think it's a space that we're gonna see expanding more and more. And I kind of already have this experience with teaching fellowship and teaching medical students. And at this point, at least, I just don't think that I'm interested in pursuing any more uh, fellowship type education. I think I wanna kind of get out there and start you know, expanding on what I already do and work clinically and also continue to educate. So with maybe expanding your reach beyond the fields of medicine, did you ever consider getting another degree like an MBA or an MPH? I have, I've thought a lot about getting an MBA. I think that it would be really helpful to kind of communicate the language that some of our business colleagues are speaking and medicine is obviously a business whether you realize that or not. And you know, to be able to speak the same language and understand those terms would be invaluable, but I'm also not sure that I couldn't get that experience just from working with those folks. So it's not something that's out of the question. It's something that I may do at a later date. 
Gotcha. Now, back to emergency medicine. What would you say is the most unique part of your specialty? Oh, we see it all. Um, everybody is kind of equal in the emergency department. It doesn't matter what area of life you come from, you're gonna get the same level of care. And so it's unique that we don't have to deal with insurance. We don't have to worry about people's um, immediate ability to afford something. We can just provide the care that we need to give. And everybody gets the same care, everybody gets high quality care. And that's something that's I'm not gonna say doesn't happen in every field, but it's nice because we don't have to go to anyone for approval. If I think someone needs an MRI, I can order that MRI um, provided it's a appropriate study. And the same, if somebody needs a procedure, I don't need to get that procedure approved. As long as it's an emergent procedure, I can do that right there. Okay. Now I always give physicians the chance to kind of sell their specialty, like a car salesman. So why should someone choose emergency medicine? I think if you like to be a team leader, you like a fast pace, you like procedures, and you like to kind of think about medicine in a different way, this could be the job for you. Uh, all of our colleagues try to diagnose things and it's kind of a weird way to think about it, but we're really less worried about the diagnosis and more worried about the ruling out of conditions. So you think about things from a different lens in that you can't send someone home with something that could kill them. And so we are trying to decide through decision rules and imaging studies and lab values that you don't have some type of a life-threatening condition. And if you do, we might have to admit you. Now, play devil's advocate for a second. Why should someone not choose emergency medicine? I think something that a lot of people look at is the lifestyle and they say, well, you only work 18 days a month, that's so easy. What you're not realizing is that we constantly work days, nights, weekends, holidays, everything switches and flip-flops. And so a lot of our days off are uh, pseudo days off. We're switching back from a night to a day or we're going from an afternoon to a morning or whatever it might be, there's a lot of days that are lost. And although they appear like they're days off, you're sleeping for most of the day. So it's tough, you need to switch your schedule a lot. And I think also if you really enjoy long-term patient care, emergency medicine doesn't really offer that. Um, some of your patients become long-term patients because they're there so much, but for the most part, uh, it's just a one-time visit with your patients. And so if you like to have that closure and follow-up, um, it's probably not the specialty for you. Okay. Are there any stereotypes about your specialty? Stereotypes. Everybody thinks emergency medicine is a cowboy, so they think that everyone's trying to do all these procedures all willy-nilly, going crazy. Um, I think that's common, and I think, you know, another thing is that people think we just order imaging on everybody. Everybody goes to CT scan, and again, you <laughs> know... Donut of truth. Donut of truth. And it is for a lot of things, but the, the thing is we actually have a... There's a lot of research that goes on in emergency medicine as to who gets imaging, decision-making tools for what labs and imaging to order, and the thing again you have to remember is in your primary care office you're not going to be scanning everybody like that but your job is not to rule out these crazy uh, potential misdiagnoses um, we don't know the patients we are meeting them for the first time so if somebody's got ripping chest pain that they say goes to their back they're probably going to get a ct scan of their chest with contra i need to look for dissection I, I don't know them well enough to say no you've had that pain before and I can't afford to send somebody home who could potentially have a dissection. So as much as it's fun to make fun of the ER doctors, um, I think that it's a really important role in the hospital. And without us, there'd be a ridiculous amount of unnecessary admissions. And uh, of course, you know, the immediate stabilization of patients too, it's, it's important. Well, next question would be, are any of the stereotypes true? Uh, I think some ER doctors are a bit cowboyish. Um, it is, especially if you're working in the community, you can really get into some pretty crazy procedures because you may not have specialists in-house. And depending on your level of comfort, uh, depends on how much you're willing to do uh, in terms of procedures. So uh, there are some folks who are a little bit more uh, wild with what they do, um, but it is all within reason. And we actually, we get a ton of training in the procedures that we are allowed to do. So uh, it is very hands-on. As for the scans, again, I think you'll find someone who's always going to order inappropriate imaging, but as a whole, I think you'd actually be surprised. If you sat down and did our job for a week, you'd probably order more imaging than you realized. Makes sense. Now, you do work at an academic hospital, and I'm sure you get to interact with a ton of med students. So what is your go-to question to ask the med students on the wards? Ooh, like a question to test their knowledge, or...? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, that's a good one. You know... I always like to, uh, I like to ask about, man, that's, that's, a, let me think about that for a second. <laughs> because it depends on what they're, what they're coming in with. I mean, I, I like, I like to kind of press med students on 
why things, why they know something is not the diagnosis. So again, we do a lot of ruling out and I think a lot of medical students, especially early on, will come and say, well, I think it's musculoskeletal chest pain. And I'll be like, really? Well, young doctor, can you tell me why this is not a pulmonary embolism? And then there's this look of like, I never even thought about that. And it's that kind of like light bulb moment of like, I didn't even know that I needed to consider that. Like this patient has everything that makes this sound musculoskeletal. And I'm like, yeah, but they take a birth control pill and it hurts when they take a deep breath in. So if you use your risk stratification, that's a high risk patient and you can't just write them off. There's no scoring tool that's gonna to say, no, there's nothing to do for that. So, you know, that in conjunction with vitals and so forth. So I think it's kind of fun to ask questions that, that make the med students think a little bit rather than just like a regular pimping question that's, you know, like what innervates the diaphragm or something like that. Those are, those are just kind of like textbook answers, but I like those deeper questions that really get people thinking. Yeah, those are really good. Home and sign uh, always needs to be checked. <laughs> um, now, what is the craziest question you've been pimped on as a student or resident? Because you're not too far in uh, to residency yet, so I'm sure the attendings probably give you give you some challenges. Yeah, um, we get a lot of tough. It, we have really great attendings, and they're really good about finding your weakness and pushing you on that. And so the thing that I notice a lot more this year is we'll get pushed on drug dosing in in critical situations because that's our job as a senior resident is to start start knowing those things and running the room. And you know, there'll be someone seizing and your regular Ativan dosing or whatever it is that you're doing is not working. And they'll say, all right, it's time for the next med. What is it and what are you gonna dose it at? And they will not let you talk to pharmacy because it's up to you to know. And obviously it's about patient care at the end of the day. If you need help, they're gonna let you get help. But um, we, we get pushed a lot in that regard. And uh, one that's funny that I remember as a med student is I got asked about the five W's of post-op. Uh, post-op infection fever or post-op fever yeah and it's wind water walking wound wonder drugs wonder about drugs and uh i'll never forget that i had no idea and i was morbidly embarrassed during rounds um because i just had no i'd never even heard of that and everybody else seemed to know so that was that was really the only time i had a really great experience through med school but that was one of the only times where i felt like really dumb on rounds i just had no idea so now, now you do a lot of shift work, so are you ever nervous at all coming into your shifts, especially as an emergency medicine resident walking in having no idea what you're about to see? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, honestly, after a year, it doesn't really phase you. You're always gonna see something that scares you. You're always gonna see new things, and I think as long as you're always humble and willing to learn and say, I don't know, I need to look this up, I need to figure this out, I don't think there's anything to be afraid of. Um, you know, there's a healthy level of fear that you never want to hurt someone. You always want to do your best. But uh, as a whole, I don't think I generally get particularly nervous. Um, I get excited sometimes for shifts, you know, uh, especially when I have a lot of energy or I have a learning goal. Um, I'll definitely, you know, get excited to get in there and start seeing patients. But uh, since intern year, it's, it's been a lot better. Intern year stuff. Good to hear. Now, we got a couple of quick fire questions now about okay. the lifestyle of an emergency medicine physician. So first one, how many patients do you see on an average day? Hmm, that's, that's good. So now as a senior, uh, on an average day shift, I'll see like 16 to 18 patients in, uh, in about a 10 hour shift. And on nights, it's a lot busier. I'll see between 20 to 25 patients usually. Um, so we're, we shoot to average about two patients an hour. That would be the goal. So on a 10 hour shift, you'd want to see 20 by the time you're a senior, uh, like a, by a third year. Um, and then attending see maybe a little bit more than that. So I'm, I'm getting there. But what's the record for the most amount of patients you've seen in a day? Oh, I saw uh, it's like 26 or 27 on an overnight shift. An uh, overnight? Yeah, so the overnights are single coverage. So especially once you're a senior, you are seeing every single patient that comes into the emergency department uh, from mm. the time the other team leaves until the morning. And it doesn't really matter if you're feeling overwhelmed because nobody else is gonna see the patient except you. What is your favorite procedure to do? I love intubation. It's uh, my absolute favorite procedure. I think we do a lot of cool procedures, but intubation to me is, is very scary and very exciting and it's a life-saving procedure. So it kind of has all the components that you want and it actually requires a very skilled operator with a lot of prep work to, to do it well. And actually the best intubation is the one that's very uh, boring to watch. And that means that you prepared well, you had everything set and everything you encountered, you had something to fix that. So. Um, I think it's a, a fun procedure, a very hands-on, skill-based procedure that requires a lot of like uh, thought and preparation. Now, more lifestyle questions that are probably really important. 
How many hours do you work in an average week? Yeah. So emergency medicine is one of the few specialties that's capped at 65 hours instead of 80 hours. Uh, and a lot of people say, again, oh, that's so amazing. But you forget that we have mandatory switches between nights and days. So that's why we have a lower cap number. I would say on average we work probably between like 58 and 60, low 60s a week. Um, it's never more than 65. I'm very fortunate in my program. Uh, the shifts are spaced out you know, well and it, it never really feels too overwhelming. What time do you normally wake up? It depends. That's, that is the uh, joy or curse of emergency medicine. Uh, I like mornings. I'm a, I'm a routine guy and I, I like to be up in the morning and, and get my day started. But unfortunately with emergency medicine, it could be anything. Sometimes I'm first waking up for the day at 7 p.m. and that's my morning and I'm going to work out then. Other times I'm getting up at 4.30 a.m. for a 5.30 a.m. start shift. So it could literally be anything and that changes multiple times through the week. What time do you normally leave the hospital? Again. It just depends. <laughs> I think the best answer I could give to that is uh, I usually leave within an hour of the end of my shift. Um, and so if we're there for a 10 hour shift, I'll leave with about 11 hours in the hospital. Uh, sometimes earlier, uh, a lot of times earlier, I'll try and stay up on my notes, but sometimes you can't help it. If you get a lot of sick patients towards the end of your shift, you're going you're gonna to get hit with uh, a little bit of extra charting at the end. That's gotcha. How many hours of sleep are you typically working on? Mm, I'm a big proponent of sleep. I think in order to perform well, you need to sleep. And I generally try to get eight hours. Um, realistically, it's sometimes more like seven, but I'll take seven any day of the week. And uh, anything less than that, I really start to decline. How many hours of sleep are you working on right now? <laughs> Today's a little <laughs> shorter. Uh, with the switch between work and uh, seeing some friends last night, we're, we're on about five and a half hours right now. Ooh. Well, that coffee there is uh, good for you. Coffee's great. Coffee is a uh, coffee and Red Bull are both uh, non medically endorsed great options. <laughs> do you have to take call? We do actually. Uh, so we cover the trauma service uh, for part of our rotations, of both the intern and a second year. And so we're on call uh, in the hospital. It's like in hospital call for 28 hours. Uh, we do ICU call technically, it's 24 hours in hospital, and then we take. It's kind of a version of home call. It's a backup call, Jeopardy system. So uh, if one of your co-residents gets sick, you could be called in to work any of our shifts at any of our sites. So I do. Okay. Now, are you a night or day shift person? Mm, I love night shift. I think the people that work night mm. shift are a special breed and they're all very hardworking. They're a fun crew to hang out with. So I really enjoy working the night shift. If it wasn't for the tough part of not being awake during the day and it messing with your sleep schedule, I would definitely work nights, but uh, it is really tough. So, interesting question because I've gotten some crazy answers from other emergency medicine physicians. How long does it take you to chart at the end of your day? Yeah, I generally try to stay up. I'm, I'm pretty aggressive about charting, so any time in between, the only things I do at work are either chart or eat. I, I like to eat <laughs> a lot, so uh, always like doing my meal prep and bringing it to work, so I'll kind of like eat and chart at the same time. I dictate everything. And so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll usually stay about 30 minutes to an hour after the end of my shift to, to finish up notes, but I do chart aggressively during my shift. And so uh, I'll try to put in HPIs wherever I can, start my MDMs, and it's usually not too late. Gotcha. Now, wholesome question. Who are you most thankful for on your care team? Oh, our nursing staff is incredible. Um, you couldn't do this job. I just had a, we were talking earlier, a really critical patient uh, three in a row critical patients all ICU level care and I got home that night and I was like there is no way literally no way that I could do this job without the nurses um, everybody knows that but in that exact situation each patient was so critical I couldn't leave the room if there wasn't a really highly skilled nurse there to take over the patient once we'd done the initial stabilization and just like that I wouldn't have been able to run the department if they weren't able to do that so um, it's the department wouldn't work without them. Yeah. Now, what is, now I'm actually looking forward to the answer to this question because you work in the ER. What is the funniest thing you've seen in a patient chart? Oh, <laughs> so we, uh, a lot of it I can't talk about, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't violate HIPAA, of course. Right, right. Um, we'll just say people have interesting stories about how things get to certain locations and all i'm going to say is if you slip and fall it's a very small target for where people find a lot of things lodged so i'm not sure how that works but it seems to be a recurring theme in a lot of folks and i just don't think 
personally, that if you slipped and fell, things would end up there. But what do I know? Not my business. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes you got to align the uh, subjective with the objective. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is the most common medical advice you give to your patients? Uh, follow up with your primary care provider. Put that in every note. Uh, I think the emergency department is unfortunately used for primary care a lot, and we can only do so much. And we, we don't know you. We don't know you like your primary care does, and we can't know you like your primary care because it's an emergency department. It's a one-off. We're supposed to be taking care of the most critical patients. And so we're happy to see everyone. We're happy to help. But things like hypertension, I can't treat that. I can't follow up with you and titrate your medications. It's just not safe for the patient or for me. So um, I always am saying, please see your primary care doctor. It's really important you make an appointment. Gotcha. Oh, fun question. What is your favorite random nerdy medical fact? Ah, uh, you know, let me think about that. And it's my day off. Let's make a drink while I'm uh, thinking. Sure. How's that sound? Sure. Sounds All good. Right. As long as I get one afterwards. Uh, I think we can make that happen. <laughs> so favorite random medical fact. I'd probably have to say the term borborygmy. It's... Uh, term for um, the sound of gurgling in your in your stomach. I think it's a really fun word. Uh, so borborygmy <laughs> is the gurgling in your stomach. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. And I think uh, today we'll make an old fashioned. It's one of my favorite drinks. It's an easy one to make. Should be able to still uh, talk and, and craft at the <laughs> same time. So I know you do a ton of simulation education stuff on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. I do. So what is your go-to simulation situation for students? That's a good one. I do a lot of sim cases, and I think probably the most fun case for students to work through is the CHF exacerbation. Because I think it incorporates a lot of things that you learn in medical school, a lot of physiology, and uh, it gives you the chance to potentially go really wrong and need to do a lot of procedures. I mean, you can order BiPAP in that case, you can talk about nitro drips. If the students do it wrong, they may need to intubate that patient. Um, you know, there's decisions about where the patient needs to go for admission. So I think it's a fun, a fun case to give medical students because it gives them a lot of um, opportunity to work through a, a tough um, medical case that culminates a lot of information that they learn. Gotcha. All right, we've done a ton of talking about your life inside the hospital. So what about your life when you clock out? What is your favorite thing to do when you are not working? Yeah, I used to do a lot more fun things, I've realized. I used to <laughs> ski a lot and mountain bike and travel all the time, and you just don't have as much time as a resident, um, but I still make time for fun. I do rock climb with my friends. I like to stay fit and work out. Um, I enjoy a good cocktail, and I'm very fortunate to live in Chicago, so I get to go out and enjoy some of the really good restaurants here with friends, co-residents. I have people visit all the time. The airport's closed, so pretty much Anything I can do to get a little social. And uh, by the way, you got to check this out. I'm going to show you this really cool ice Ooh, press here. Let's see it. Let me grab the ice here. So we've got these giant cubes, totally non-medically related. But since we're talking about fun things, this is, <laughs> this is kind of cool. So we'll dump the ice out onto the bar mat. And then watch this. So this thing is solid copper. I'll let you figure out the magic behind how this works. We put the cube in there. And boom. So... That'll kind of run its course, and while that's going down, why don't we do another question? Okay. So does your family ever ask you for random medical advice? Oh my gosh, all the time. I think anyone that's even in med school gets asked for medical advice all the time. Um, you know, you don't want to give medical advice to those who aren't patients, but you want to help out your friends and family, and so I'll usually give them an idea of what's going on and then recommend that uh, they talk to their primary care doctor. It's always a safe answer. Always. What is the weirdest question a family friend has ever asked you? Yeah, we'll, we'll spare some dignity and just leave it at rashes. Lots of rashes. <laughs> get lots of text pictures of rashes and wondering what kind of tests they should get. And uh, again, I always suggest going to their doctor. Again, safe bet. Oh, Ooh, yeah. Is, is it done? It's done. Let's check this out. Ooh, so, let's see it. Ready? We pull that off and we have a perfect sphere. Now I made a TikTok about this and people got really triggered that I called it a circle. So it is a sphere. <laughs> and uh, we'll drop this sphere into here. And there you have it. We can kind of spin that around. That we're is, ready to go. That is so cool. Isn't it? Wish I had one of those at my house. <laughs> Eventually, right? Eventually. This was actually a gift from, from Meltdown. So I really appreciated that. Okay. Now, favorite animal, not a dog or cat. 
Favorite animal that's not a dog or cat? I feel like I would want a monkey. I think a monkey or a bear. I think if I could a hug bear? a bear without being attacked, I think they're big and really like majestic lion. I guess I like like big animals. I think they're very like majestic to see them and, and watch them move and their, their strength and power. So uh, one, of, one of the big animals. Okay. Any artistic hobbies you keep up with? Which uh, I think we saw a studio in the back, or at least the people haven't seen it yet. Well, you know what? Let me grab my keys. We'll enjoy this drink up on the roof, and I'll tell you about some of my hobbies up there. But All right. Let's get my keys first. A little sneak peek into. Ooh. Yeah, a little behind the scenes. What goes on Got here? The studio in here, film for YouTube and TikTok, and do all my sim cases there, everything live. So uh, we certainly stay busy, and that's kind of the the workspace. I really do all my work in there. So let's head up to the roof. And I'll tell you about some of my all hobbies, right. though. So I do have artistic hobbies and mainly uh, I like to play guitar. I used to play in a band in college and so um, you know that was something that I always really enjoyed and I also do a lot of photography and travel photography and I used to do more of it. Uh, in med school I got to travel more and so I did a little bit more photography then but uh, I really enjoy being able to express myself through photography and uh, kind of showcase the world literally through my lens but like to, to give it my own appearance and take so that's awesome how long have you been doing those i've been doing photography uh since med school i picked it up so i guess it's been six years now okay yeah. now fun question if you could have dinner with anyone in history who would it be uh if i could have dinner with anyone in history I think Neil Armstrong would be incredible. Um, man on the moon, brilliant gentleman, drove a Corvette, which is a big car guy. So I think it'd be really cool to get a perspective of what life was like then. Okay. And what would you guys be eating at that dinner? If we went to that dinner, I would probably have, I'm a big seafood fan, so I like lobster, oysters. Um, that would be definitely a choice for me. Uh, I like steak, so surf and turf is a good option. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I would go with that. What's your favorite dish to eat? Favorite dish ever? Yeah. Ooh. I'm a big sushi fan, so like a good omakase. I just yes. recently, in 2019, right before all of this, I went to Japan and I got to have some real omakase at very small restaurants in, in Japan and it was incredible. I, I absolutely loved it. All right, coffee, tea, or soda? Oh, coffee. coffee. Coffee? Yeah, big big coffee fan. Maybe not a coffee snob, but I really enjoy my coffee and uh, you know I like a good latte. I'm a PSL guy, so okay. <laughs> I like coffee. So I always love this question because every doctor gives me a different answer. How much water should you be drinking every day? Oh, I don't know what the numerical answer is, but a lot. You should be hydrated. Water's not gonna hurt you, so, uh, well, that's not true. A lot of water will hurt you, <laughs> but for the most part, the average amount, I would say, uh, you know, drink at least 32 ounces of water, 40 ounces of water a day, whatever it is. I have multiple 40 ounce bottles a day. I probably drink uh, somewhere on the order of like, I don't know, I have a 40 ounce Hydro Flask and I drink like three of them a day and I'm still standing, so I think more is good. Favorite meal from the hospital cafeteria, if you have one? Oh, our, our cafeteria, this is a great overnight meal, has a, they have biscuits and gravy in the morning, and it's so unhealthy, and I never would eat that normally, but after an overnight shift, I'll get some eggs, some biscuit and gravy, a little bit of bacon, and I just celebrate the fact that I'm alive. The Southern in me uh, is very happy about that. Yeah. So, what is one thing you would say you were oddly good at? Ooh, I have a really good sense of balance on a bicycle so one of the hobbies that I left off earlier I don't know if, if we even talked about this I used to uh, have a motorcycle that was track track focused only it was a R6 that was made for the racetrack and so I've always been really into motorcycles motocross downhill mountain biking and uh, I can wheelie a bicycle um, infinitely it's like there's an infant cheat on so um, I could go around turns up and down hills um, so that's kind of my weird skill nice what is one random task you wish you could be better at? Oh, singing. I wish I could sing better. I think there's nothing more beautiful than like a naturally beautiful, rich voice. And I don't have one of those. And uh, I, w I would love to be able to do that, especially to go along with the guitar. It'd be, be really nice. All right, probably the most controversial question on here. 
Pineapple and pizza, yes or no? Uh, probably a no for me. Okay. Favorite TikTok sound at the moment? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> right now, I'm really enjoying the, oh no, our glass table, or whatever. It's, it's broken. Yeah, <laughs> they broke our glass, whatever that is. That one cracks me up. Um, that's probably the, the, my favorite, most appropriate TikTok sound right now. Okay. Top three music artists. Of all time? For you. For me. So, um, hot take, but the reason that I play guitar is because of the band Fall Out Boy, which is from Chicago. Actually, if we look out the window, uh, the lead guitarist dad is a cardiologist over here at Rush. So, uh, Joe Trotman's dad is still a cardiologist, I'm told, there to this day. So, uh, Fall Out Boy is a big one for me, very influential. Uh, all Time Low is another kind of pop punk band that's really made me into you know, the guitarist that I am and why I play music and uh, kind of other end of the spectrum. Uh, I've really been digging Elenium lately and EDM type music, so Elenium, Zed, um, those kind of artists are, I think, incredibly talented as well. It's a really unique type of music, so I enjoy that stuff. Gotcha. What is one song you would recommend anyone listen to before they die? I'm biased, but if you have not heard Dear Maria, Count Me In, that song is a banger. <laughs> I will swear by that. I don't know anyone that's heard that song and thought that was terrible. So it will bring you back to your teen years that you may have never had. What is the best way that you relax after a long day? Mm. It depends how tired I am. If I have the energy, I like to go to the gym. If I don't have the energy, honestly, sometimes I'll come up here, sit by the fire pit, look outside, and just kind of enjoy the skyline, either direction, really. Um, or Xbox, I'm guilty. Sometimes I just need to veg out and play some Xbox. Ain't nothing wrong with that. So, night in or go out on the town kind of person? Again, it just depends on the day. I kind of, I like to do both. If I'm beat and really tired, I'm doing the night in. I'm going to bed, playing Xbox and going to bed. But, you know, if I have a weekend off and I can get a little bit of extra sleep and time, I want to go out. I want to explore some restaurants. Indoors or outdoors? Oh, outdoors, yeah. Beach or mountains? If I can have a bike and skis, mountains. Would you consider yourself more of an introvert or an extrovert? I hate that question. I <laughs> think I'm an extroverted introvert. That's how I would qual qualify it. And do you think that personality trait was a factor in you choosing your specialty? I don't actually. I, I don't think. I, I don't think that flows over into work. I mean, I do enjoy like connecting with people and things, but I think work is separate from personal life. As, as it healthily should be. It should be, in my opinion, yeah. absolutely. So we're getting close to the end. We only got a few more questions left, but these are Bring more it. reflective questions. So take your time with these. Let's do it. So what did you think you were going to be when you grew up as a kid? Oh. Let's sit down and I'll reflect. I think yeah. that uh, when I was really young, what I wanted to do was drive an excavator or construction equipment like a lot of young boys and so uh, that never came to fruition but it's something that I wanted to do and I think pretty early on I got involved with EMS and you know I was an EMT and so I enjoyed taking care of patients I enjoyed that emergent critical situation and uh, yeah I, I I guess I was like teen years and I kind of knew that that's what I was going to do. So, is there a different specialty you think you could have done? I do. I think uh, I probably also could have, could have done okay in anesthesia. I think it's a fun specialty. It's a different pace, but they also get to do a lot of intubations. They get a lot of central lines, procedures, double lumen tubes. It's, it's pretty cool. So, if you didn't do medicine, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Mm. You know, it's funny, I used to say, like in college, I was really interested in, I don't know, I, I know some reasons of why I like to drive and things, but I was interested in like law enforcement and I was like, it's a good chance to help people and increase safety. And now with the climate, I'm very glad that I'm not in that field and I don't think that's what I would do at all. Um, I really, these days I do a lot with marketing and business and I think that's really fascinating and another really interesting way to, to work with people and to help in a different way, so I think maybe it would be something in marketing. I think it's really creative and fun. Now, anybody that has gone through the medical field, no matter what career it is, knows that it is not easy. So were there any times throughout the process that you doubted you would make it as a doctor? 
Oh yeah. I don't think I'll ever forget this because I'm not someone who cries very often. Um, there was an exam my second year of med school. It was a GI exam. And I came back from the test. I studied so hard and I came back from the test and was like almost certain that I failed and I just started crying. I just like started crying and laid on the floor and I was just like, I don't think I can do this anymore. And I think if you're not going through that, you're probably not pushing yourself or you're not in this, I don't know, wholeheartedly because you put so much on yourself, so much stress and, and you wanna be the best uh, that you can be and it's, it's stressful and it's hard and I'll never forget that moment. And there are times in residency already that I've been very, very stressed and thought, I don't know if I can keep doing this. This is so hard, so many hours and so stressful, but there's a lot of positives too and a lot of upsides. So ultimately it's worth it. If you could change one thing about the medical field right now, what would it be? Oh, I would change a lot of things. <laughs> Just one. Just one. I would take insurance out of the mix. I think everybody needs healthcare. And I think the fact that insurance has anything to do with the decision that a clinician makes is just, it's hard to even wrap my head around. And it's infuriating, and we'll leave it at that. What can a medical student do right now to prepare to go into this specialty? I think just be open-minded. We were talking about this last night with a couple of my friends who are residents, and we have such a low expectation for what a med student should bring to the table. We basically just want a positive attitude just have a good attitude and come to learn and be excited and that's all you need like emergency medicine is a get your hands dirty specialty get involved and you're gonna get to see cool things and so I think it's just a matter of being willing to to jump in now if you were to go back would you change any of your experiences that got you to where you are right now honestly and you can Monday morning quarterback anything and go back and change stuff but I wouldn't change my path uh, I'm very happy with where I am. I've worked very hard to, to get to where I am, and uh, I think each experience I've had has kind of helped define my career and helped me grow as a person, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, the ups and the downs, the, it's, it's all made me kind of who I am now. I think a lot of physicians would agree with you as well. And we are at the end, question 73. All right. What would you say to the aspiring emergency medicine physician right now? Let's say believe in yourself. Make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and then just believe in yourself. Um, there's always going to be negative kind of news and people telling you medicine's not worth it and there's not going to be jobs and all of these other sorts of problems. And just remember that there's always going to be a need for doctors and things are going to go through ebb and flow, ups and downs, salaries are going to change and all of these things. But at the end of the day, what you do is you get to help people. And that's across medicine and especially in emergency medicine, you get to help everyone. People that you know, are on one end of the spectrum of socioeconomic in a bad situation that are maybe homeless and have nowhere else to go. And you're also gonna help you know, the ultra rich occasionally who are in a you know, severe bind. And so you, you see all walks of life and you get to help everybody equally. It's very rewarding. And so just know that the work that you put in is worth it and you will help people and you know, all it takes is that one, that one patient who says thank you, who literally thanks you directly for, for what you've done, for your care. Um, that's all it takes to, to know that it's worth it. Well, I think that's a fitting conclusion to the interview. Thank you so much, Dr. Gukov. That's all I have for you today. Enjoy your time off, man. Appreciate it. Thanks so much.